My name is Lyndon Davis. I'm a direct descendant of the Gubby Gubby people of the Sunshine Coast area. Part of my um, Aboriginal descendancy comes from the Mooloola Bar area, the Mooloola Plains. So basically looking back just out, out here where we are now with the backdrop behind me. On the other side of my family, we have very strong connections to the South Sea Islands. Mare Island, New Caledonia, and also Ober Island right next to Vanuatu. The Gubby Gubby people, they've lived in the Sunshine Coast for tens of thousands of years. Our cultural and spiritual beliefs are deeply connected to the care and responsibility for land. Budrum, or Budurum in our language, means hairpin banks here. They grow along the lower slopes of Budrum. Budrum also refers to rising up, which reflects Budrum's importance as a landmark and a smoke signalling point. Budrum was an important crossroads for my people, travelling the song lines and pathways to that famous Bunya Festival and the Blackhall Ranges. There were big changes for the Gubby Gubby people during the 1820s and 30s. This was when we had first contact with the white man. By the end of the 1870s, Many of our people had died from smallpox or, despite our resistance, been massacred during the free settlement period. In the 1860s, Tom Petrie and others started to officially cut timber on Budrum Mountain. With the cutting down of um, the red cedar tree in this area by Tom Petrie, the first white man to set foot on Budrum, pretty much uh, established Budrum uh, as it is today. The Gubby Gubby people were the main labour force as there was only seven settlers living in the area at that time. Our job was to cut and drag timber. We also assisted to clear land for pastoralists. By 1868, the forestry reserves of Budrum had been exhausted and industry moved their operations elsewhere. By the 1880s, Budrum had been divided up into smaller allotments and farming dominated the plateau. Out of the 4,000 strong Gubby Gubby people, it is estimated that only 40 to 50 of my people remain. Budrum was one of the first farming regions outside of Brisbane and because of the climate, many tropical species were grown for the first time in Queensland. Sugarcane, bananas, pawpaw, pineapple, and other tropical fruits were growing, but there was a shortage of labour. Blackbirding refers to the recruitment of people through trickery and kidnapping to work on the sugarcane plantations in Queensland. Our people were blackbirded from islands such as Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Nui, and my island ancestor from the Loyalty Islands in New Caledonia and Vanuatu. Australian Aboriginal people, particularly from the Cape York, were also kidnapped. It is estimated that somewhere between 55,000 and 62,000 people were blackbirded between the 1860s to the start of the 19th century. Most of them worked as slave labour.
They were brought here back in the, those 1860s for slavery to come over to, to cut the cane for the European settlers that had settled here when Queensland became a state. And so my great-great-grandfather was brought over on those boats and brought over here to work and cut the cane and live here on Budra Mountain. And there was uh, some of our Aboriginal people still living here, you know, as we said, it was up to 40 to 50 uh, Aboriginal people strong, uh, considering that there was 4,000. My grandmother was only about seven years old when she was taken. And she used to tell, tell me quite often that they rode out to the, uh, the all these big boats pulled, pulled in and, and anchored up. So they loaded up the, these canoes and rode out with all this food. And they uh, were having a party and the next thing they know, they woke up in the hold to the ship out at sea. So that was the last they ever seen of their homeland. My great, great, great grandfather come here in the 18, I'm, guess, I'm guessing now, 18, about the 1850s or 60s. Oh, they lived down over here, to, uh, I've been down Bly Bly or further down those, when he first was blackbirded over here. And Cut came then, he come up to Budrum then. I think he was one of the first uh, South Sea Islanders to come up here. Some of the South Sea Island men mixed with the Aboriginal women and some of them, you know, became partners and man and wife. And uh, that's, that's how it pretty much started with our family up here. Uh, a great-great-grandfather from the Loyalty Islands married the great-great-grandmother from the Malula Plains district. Oh no, there was a lot of uh, mm. connection between the uh, Aboriginal community and the South Sea Island community. Was, I mean, we grew up, um, I don't think even as a child you recognised who was, you, there was no such thing as South Sea no. and no, Aboriginal, we were just one, one, the mob that one lived family. in this area. Yeah. Back in those days, South Sea Islanders, even though they were slaves, they had more of a say and they were, had much more respect from the white people more so than the Aboriginal people. So some Aboriginal of our, our ancestors, great-great-grandmother, married South Sea Island man maybe to hide from the fact that she you know, has Aboriginal bloodline. A lot of the Aboriginal culture at times was perhaps, perhaps overlooked for more the South Sea Island thing because South Sea Islanders weren't under the threat of being taken and put on com on communities. Maybe, you know, that's some of the reasons why, uh, you know, it's survival. You have to survive and, you know, our old people, they always talk about homelands and how important the, the earth and the place where you're born and where you're raised and not to leave those places but, you know, to hold them very strong to, to you and to your, your family. And so, you know, to be removed from country it's like, yeah, you, you actually, you know, you're dying. You're dead if you're removed from our country. And so that's why it was such a fight to stay on country. And the only way to stay on country was to uh, basically hide in the South Sea Island camps that were uh, here at that particular time. We were actually mum. Yeah, she mentioned it very often that, you know, she came from Budrum. And, but at this stage we were living in Western Queensland in a town called Roma. And, you know, we were thinking, oh yeah, you would you came from Budrum <laughs> and you know, we took it with a grain of salt. But back then, uh, there was still quite a bit of concern about people taking the kids being able to be removed and taken away and my, our mother was sort of more protective uh, of us and you know did basically almost to the stage of denying your Aboriginality. Uh, I know for instance that uh, in one of the bedrooms at the house at home in Roma where we were raised, there was a cupboard, built-in cupboard put into one of the walls and we used to do drills, basically 
to move the bed out, dive into the cupboard and hide if anybody came. <laughs> Mr. Bernard <laughs> called him Yellow Belly. Oh, that was the last time we were here, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's fine upstairs. Hey, Borrow a mic? Uncle George Eggmalese. Pop's great grandfather, Thanks. Arthur Lifu. What time is coming? So this guy's oh, like a. Indian guy, this is like Aboriginal, Aboriginal, Aboriginal. Yeah, well respected, the king plate. Yeah, that works. Oh, yeah. Granddad Muck and just down this way. Oh, read, yeah. And um, Pop was saying when he was a little fella, he used to come up here and get the milk. Hey, Pop. We used to live down behind Middleton Chop and we went to school in Budrum. That's where you have, yeah, Budrum. Yeah. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, Pop, this is it, eh? Hmm? This place here? Yeah. Okay. Mum was living here. I, I run down through those rocks. No worries. <laughs> a dark night. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was a bit pinchy all the way down. <laughs> oh. This area behind us, this is where Pops would talk about where they would come and um, wash the clothes and, and get fresh clean water from one of the springs just down here. Now when I first came in with Pop, he was standing up here and he goes, oh yeah boy, just down the hill there, there's a, um, there's a little spring that, um, that we use for washing and to get our water source from, you know. And so I walked down there, I, I didn't think there was a, anything down there, and the next minute you could hear the little trickling of the water, and sure enough, the spring's there and it's still flowing, and uh, that was one of the main sort of places where, you know, source of water was. The spring water, eh, it's got um, a little bit cooler and stuff, you know. This particular spring definitely would have been used by the Muckins and the Wimbus families that would just live just up on the top of the hill there and other South Sea Island families. It was common knowledge. Everybody sort of knew the springs and the importance of the water and, and it's somebody's job to collect it in the morning, collect it at lunchtime, collect it at dinner time. You know, and that's one of Nan's responsibilities. That's what she used to do. My grandmother was born, she was born over on the eastern slope of Budra Mountain. Um, looking over Malula Bar there, not similar sort of outlook like this, looking out towards the ocean. And she was born on Marlow's farm back in 1923. At that time, other one Nanny, I call other one Nanny, my great grandmother, Nan's mum. She was pregnant with Nan, and she, at that particular time when Nan was born, she was um, doing the tree lopping for the, the timber getters in the area. And so she had to use the springboards and get right to the top of the tree and chop the tops of it. That was her job and she was quite skilled at it and good at it. And that's why she was on the work crew uh, with those men. And the only woman too, by the way. And, um, you know, she was pregnant with Nan and um, she said, oh, I need to give birth. And so she climbed back down the tree and went into a secluded area, hidden away from the other workers, and she gave birth to Nan. Remember Charlie Chili, he was the eldest, eldest Chili. And uh, he was a terrific footballer. And he used to do all the goal kicking, but he never wore boots. He used to play barefoot. He, to, he could kick from the halfway line. <laughs> no boots. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, we did do sports. I used to do big row and basketball and everything like that, and cricket. And yes, all the family used to do that too, so yes. That's where we got it from, really, really got it from, when the old people used to play it. Reflexes and, you know, being able to run fast and all those sorts of things, and it, it comes from, you know, my, my bloodline. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, photo in the, in the Budrum's Historical Museum of uh, 
of the All Blacks cricket side in 1930s with the Muckins and the and the Egmalees and um, and uh, and the Chilies. We enjoyed our sports. Yes, we used to go to Nambour and you know they used to call us what they used to call us bugrums. Yes, <laughs> used to call us that. Yes, <laughs> bugrums. <laughs> I used to play cricket up on the oval, but also the uncles used to play a fair bit of cricket on the oval. And right there, that's where the fools were behind it. So we used to, you know, watch the uncles for a little bit, but you know, must be in kids. Where's, where's the water, where's the creeks, you know? And that's where we used to be. On those falls, playing on those falls, and uh, drinking the water, splashing in the water, swimming in the water, you know? And checking out all the yabbies and all the animals and the eels and turtles. It's, uh, it was just one of those places where you could really um, have a lot of fun. When you look at your history and you look at some of those old photos, well, you know where all of that, uh, those skills sort of uh, originally come from, from our ancestors, which is really, really good to know, eh? You know, if you, you feel like you're, you're them, you know, because um, they're part of you, you're part of them, and it all makes sense in the end, eh? We do have families that, are people in our families that were taken, and um, luckily if it wasn't for some you know, early settlers back in those days were actually like, um, almost like allies and, and stood up for us and helped us and, and we actually worked for those people. And so in a way, you know, they, they protected us from being removed and, um, and I'll never forget that if it wasn't for those European settlers, the Westaway families, if it wasn't for them, well, I, I probably would not be uh, sitting here today. Could be a bush tucker, eh? Wait a while. So, what Pop moved to Budrum in the 1930s, yeah. and um, he was working for the Foot family, and he was working up in um, Foot Sanctuary for quite a long time. They sold him this land for, I don't know. Very cheap anyway, I don't know what it was, 40 cents an acre, I think it was. He had banana plantations yeah, and he had strawberries, strawberries beans. beans. Mommy. And then he worked the land for quite a while. And yeah. He finished up with oh, acres and acres. He, he donated a lot of it to the Lutheran church down the bottom. Was, uh, they uh, built a church and a school down there. He donated four hectares of land, which is the path here yeah. now. He did a lot for the community pop and I think, um, you know, with all the um, other families that were here, he was very well known and respected by, you know, all the white families as well as the Aboriginal yeah. and other yeah. Islander families. I was living with Nan, you know, from two months old, along with my um, two sisters, uh, Bridget and Renee. And we all lived there at Carter Road in Nambour. And so, you know, when we were young, Nan would sit around the table there after she'd cooked the feed and. She'd be having a cigarette and drinking a tea, and then she'd talk about, you know, all the all the stories and that that um, that happened up here. But it was really, you know, it was really it was really good when we, you know, listened to all those things because um, it sort of gave us a connection connection to country, eh? Yeah, that's where our families have got very strong connections to, and still do. I love going up to Budrum. Um, you know, I still live here on the coast, that's right. Born and raised here, I'd never leave here. But yeah, I've done a lot of work up in Budrum over the years, gone into the schools, actually did a mural in the school where Nan went to school, where Pop went to school, where Annie Max, where they all went to school. This is the mural that we did with the Budrum school. And um, this circle here, well, I, I actually did it. And um, the circle here represents water. We know that water is, you know, readily found around Budrum area springs coming out, you know, the creeks are always flowing and full of water. And so that's what this symbol here represents in the middle, the lines representing the water courses that the springs make. And then I've just basically did the animals that um, the kids actually suggested these animals, what animals, you know, that are in their district and what they have seen. So fish, platypus, goanna, snake, and you know, the basic ones. And then I've just got the hand stencil showing the significance of Aboriginal people living in Budrum or Budrum in our language, the hairpin honeysuckle. And so the hairpin honeysuckle I've represented down here. So we've added little bits and pieces of what's 
in the district here. Um, well, look, it's my, my big cousins here. I'm originally from Brisbane, and uh, I'm 32 years old. And, and it took me 30 years to come up here to learn more about me, me culture and uh, me dances and that, because I was. I don't know, I was too wrapped up in my city life, but uh, seeing what my cousins and that have achieved, I uh, definitely wanted to be a part of it. So I figured, better late than never. And I'm here now, I'm doing my dances, I'm, I'm making my people proud. You know, my, my grandfather, who's no longer here, but my grandmother and my mother and all that, who come from here, doing them all proud so that I can at least keep this going for our next generation and so I can teach my kids and my kids' kids. So that's why I find myself here and hopefully for many more years to come. It's great to be here, you know, and uh, to um, be in the area where the people sort of lived and, and gathered. And it was lovely here. It was a really nice and bedroom because, you know, the people didn't look down on you sort of thing. It was asked, you know, how he was accepted in the community and you know, what people thought of him and that, and he just said that, you know, he was treated no differently to anyone else, which sort of reflects upon what everyone else was saying today, like it was just one community here in Budra. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, no. I've had a very good life, and uh, I can only put it down to all the people that I've met and known around this district. With um, this generation now, like with Lyndon and myself and how Nathan was saying before, we want to try and get, you know, a lot more involvement back into the culture to bring it back into the Sunshine Coast. Mm. Because I think that's imperative as well, you know, to acknowledge the Aboriginal and the South Sea Island people because that's who we come from, the bloodlines mm. and that. Yeah. It's just a real special place in the fact that, you know, our people were, were born and raised there and died there, you know, and buried there. That's probably why it's so um, significant. So it's almost like a sacred place, yeah, you know. We, we know our South Sea Island background, that's for sure. You know, Nan told us that we're South Sea Island fellas too, but also don't forget, you're also Aboriginal as well from the Malula Plains district, which is, uh, you know, it's great for us to know. So now I know that information, I can pass it on to them younger ones that are, that, uh, you know, never met Nan and never got exposed to those old stories. Now I can be that person and, 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 and pass it on there that way. So it's, um, it's really um, interesting history when you sort of delve into it and um, the, the South Sea Island people and the, you know, the connections to the areas and how they mingle and how they survived really. It's very interesting to me because it's also part of who I am. So to understand all that stuff gives me a sort of a, a better understanding on who I am. <laughs>